good. Nothing. Nothing? Why not? I'm trying to get on the Slice Down Radio website. Sounds like a cool website. Yeah, it's alright. Oh, yeah, I might have it. You might have it. You're listening to Lifestyle Radio. Good evening. I'm Coulter Wontight. I'm already into the 420. Damn it. Music, you like weed, well we gonna be good friends indeed This is how much I like more than smoking trees They'll make you dance the do si do And teach you how to achieve a grow Smoke a bowl on the 420 radio show On Lifestyle Radio We are live, and my audio is really low, so I'm going to turn everything up. One, oh, now it's too loud. No, I'm kidding, man. Now it's too loud. Yeah, well, that's uh, <coughs> how it works, buddy. There we go. One. Give me a count, please. We're going to start. One, two, sh- three, four. There you go. Can you hear me? Can you hear us? Can you hear all of us? I can hear Marcel and Al quite fine. There, and we can hear Nadine. Yes, we can. There we go. I think I think I've got it now. This is the Fort Twenty Radio Show. We are live on LifestyleRadio.net. If you want to come into the chat room and say hello, say hello. And I uh, heard an echo. Echo. <laughs> I think that was just you. Yeah, it was. Hello, Nadine. Hello. Um, I don't know who I'm talking to. Is this Al? This is Al. It Bonjour, is. Al. Comment ça va? Um. I I I just want to say that uh, you know you're a very brave woman for standing up for you know what's happened and we're going to we're going to talk with Nadine and find out right from the horse's mouth so to speak because there's a lot of rumors going around this happened that happened and uh you know rumors can go spit right I agree yeah so I'd rather get the information from the horse, but Nadine, I'm not calling you a horse. No, we're not calling you a horse. We're calling the situation a horse. <laughs> no problem. I have no. I love horses. Well, it is okay, Cal. Well, you are in Calgary. A horse. I mean, <laughs> that's up to you. Horse, cow, pig. I think I was born in the year of the pig, so I have no problem. Okay, so <laughs> let's start right off the bat here because I want to know what happened. Uh, can you explain to me, kind of? chronologically everything that led up to and after and what happened and all that well I prepared a historiography on the matter and it the this particular incident was not spontaneous it materialized over about uh, well Mar- from March 24th to March 31st which coincidentally happens to be the anniversary death date of the MMAR but what happened, I had enrolled into CDI College to get my paralegal uh, designation in order to qualify as an adult student to get my JD in Canada or my LLB over in the UK because I'm a British citizen. And I had commenced to take this course at CDI College. I advised them I was a cannabis patient, had an expired license, showed them my expired license, they photocopied it on my admission, and filed it. Never had another concern, never thought about it again until one day um, I was sitting in class with uh, one of my mates and uh, we were talking about, he asked me, he was a, a young Asian fellow, really computer smart but not too good English skills and yeah, I had great English skills and I'm computer illiterate so we were helping each other out. I helped him with the interpret the instruction and he'd show me where these instructions were on the computer. Man, um, I have it, dear. Um, that was my doctor asking me if I managed to open this website. That's okay. I lost my train of thought. Okay, so we were. I was sitting in class talking to this student, and uh, he just asked me. He says, "Well, where do you work?" And I said, "Well, I don't work anywhere per se. I just work with some great folks and some lawyers, and we try to." Uh, remedy some laws and regulations in the cannabis medical, medical cannabis industry that we felt weren't fair, these new ones. Are being, but you got to understand these boys were right off the boat from China, so we're very limited. So we changed the conversation. They had no idea what I was talking about. Uh, uh, so I also told them, well, I'm also a historiographer, 
and I'm writing a book for a, a man called Andrew Basiago who claims to be part of the jump room programs, NASA's jump room programs and have been to Mars and that fact. So we started talking about the Roswell crash and the alien that got recovered and the alien interviews and all of a sudden the CDI director came storming out, education director, her, came out storming out of her office and she said, you know what, screaming at me, just having you know a real uh, issue about talking in class and it was break time. She, was, she said, I don't want you talking anymore. I don't want you talking about this anymore. We looked at each other, the student and I, we thought, he doesn't want us talking about aliens. Well, no, it wasn't aliens. It was the previous conversation about medicinal cannabis. Apparently a student not party to this conversation had heard yeah, me explaining right. about the medicinal benefits of ca cannabis and she's from Afghanistan and she doesn't believe this to be a good product. And she went and complained to the director that I was talking about cannabis. Meanwhile, by the time she went and complained to the director, and the director came storming out, we changed the conversation. That I, I went to talk to the director, and I said, I would like to use this uh, opportunity for an education, you know, a teaching moment, and to explain to you that, you know, give you some information on medicinal cannabis to teach these students that many of them are fresh off the boat. Yeah. That we do, you know, have this in Canada, maybe not in their motherlands, but we have this policy or law in Canada whereby, you know, patients have this option. Well, that was on <laughs> March 24th, the next day. I went to school. I was sitting there at my computer doing a, uh, an instructor led program, had to pay very careful attention. These two girls sitting in front of me that are part of the paralegal program turned around and one sneered, So, what is it that? What's wrong with you? What's your medical condition that requires you to smoke pot every hour? And I politely replied that I'm a breast cancer survivor and suffered massive neuropathy throughout the upper left quadrant of my body and suffered some severe arthritis, transglobal amnesia, had all these things wrong with me in 65. Uh, and I attempted to, to return my attention to the assignment. <clears throat> and uh, the first student, she interrupted my concentration by loudly responding to the entire classroom. It's a learning center with about 100 students in it. That, that Well, she was also a cancer survivor and certainly did not require to smoke pot every hour, kind of paraphrasing her, and thereby drawing the attention of the students. I tried to quickly explain to her that I underwent a radical mastectomy, which not only re removed my entire breast, but also the entire surrounding muscle and lymphatic system under my arm, and attempted to go back to my studies. But by then, her little partner, which I call student number two, had joined into the conversation and had begun to verbally accost me, causing me to feel greatly tormented and humiliated in front of the whole class. They were saying, you don't need to smoke pot, you smell like pot, all of this stuff. So I knew, I, I tried to once again to explain to them there are many forms of cancer and one's illness should never be compared to another and that this type of surgery was so radical women were dying from complications to the surgery and not the cancer and therefore that deadly radical mastectomy was terminated in 1987 several weeks after I'd had my surgery. Well this remark caused student one and student two to just loudly be tormented and humiliated in front of the whole class. They were saying Going, yeah, they sorry. were just having a hyster the whole they they were just hysterical. I'm not kidding, just hysterical by now laughing and judging me, ridiculing me, loudly proclaiming that I was using cancer as an excuse to smoke pot. Well, I told them I never smoked pot in my life. I threw more pot down the outhouse than you could imagine. I never liked the smell. It made me feel paranoid. And I was happy with my pharmaceuticals till it destroyed my liver. But they didn't want to hear that. So I became really irritated and uh, I loudly proclaimed, I stood up at my desk, I said, I am a licensed patient under Health Canada and not a criminal. And I uh, went back, tried to go back to my assignment. The outburst had gotten so disruptive by that time. Uh, I was pleased to see a CDI campus director come over and I thought, oh great, she's going to tell these students to you know, behave, quit tormenting me. Well, to my surprise and shock and dismay, I observed the director profusely apologize to these two students, complaining that there was n absolutely nothing she could do 
about the problem because she, the problem, has a right. And, uh, well, by that time I couldn't keep my emotions under control and I thought, well, I'm going to cause some trouble here or I better, and I can't focus my attention back on my sign. I was just shaking, so I chose to leave. I thought, well, nobody's going to come on my side, so I, I left the school. The next day, um, <clears throat> I, I think I became really upset. I can't remember. I went I went to see the, during in the searing days, I went to see the director, tried to explain to them, show them my information. By then, um, the whole school knew that I carried cannabis on me, most likely too, because I was a licensed patient. Now, I'm like about, a, I only weigh 92 pounds now, because I've lost 18 pounds since this event. And, I mean, these people are not the sharpest tools in this box. This is an adult learning center. Most of these people are fresh off the boat from parts of the world where you carry a machete, and it's not nice. There's no such thing as democracy. And I thought, I, I really got upset with the director, and I said, you had no business doing that. She told me, <clears throat> if I don't like it, go smoke uh, go smoke my pot in the, uh, she said, told me she was too sick to deal with the matter. She wasn't feeling well. Um, so... Go smoke you, should my told her, you should have told her she should go smoke a joint if she wasn't feeling well. Well, I did tell her. I said, maybe kind of <laughs> phytotherapy. And, she, I says, and I said, so how's your pharmaceuticals working for you? <laughs> and, and I said, perhaps you should try cannabis phytotherapy. Well, she did not. She was not impressed with that at all. She did not fail to find the humor in that remark. And uh, so I left her office. But what, 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 an issue that preceded this uh, was that the school had, uh, does not have any dispute resolution tribunal or student council or anything like that. Students were complaining left all the time about fraud and not getting their money. And I said, well, I'll check this school out. Well, lo and behold, it took me about five minutes to find out the owner of the CDI college, just Peter Chung, the owner of Emanata Group is a fugitive from California, wanted with, on $12 million worth of fines for over 10,000 uh, California state violations of the education system. The same thing he's doing here. He just skipped bail and uh, moved up here into Canada and set up all his CDI classes, ripping off our government, the same he did in the States. So I went to the director and I said, look, you've got a lot of students here with concerns and we would like to know what system of dispute resolution you have before you start kicking these kids out that they've just got fresh off the boat with $25,000 loans and they can't handle the program because they're not properly qualified. They can barely read and write English, never mind calculate a formula for an Excel program. You know, these people take their money, they couldn't care less. So she said, well, I'm the, you come to me if you have a problem. I thought, okay, <laughs> it's, that is no dispute resolution at all. So I, I realized that, you know, if you don't like it, get out. So I told these students, you know, there's no hope in hell you're ever gonna, they're ever going to support you forming a student council, but if you want to, I'll show you how to do it. And that's where, that's what preceded all of this. I do believe some of the stuff that materialized why the instructor was mad at me anyway. I had hoped to use, um, you know, these queries as a teaching moment for these students, but nothing worked. Everything I tried to do just didn't work. So uh, I got sick. I didn't think I went to school for a day or two. I was really stressed. Well, I went back on a Monday, March 31st. I was sitting there at my desk um, doing my work, and uh, it was 11.55, just getting ready to leave for lunch. And a big, big Calgary policeman came up to my desk in front of 300 students and ordered me into this room to have a little talk about my smelling like pot. And I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> so he took the whole, mind you, this whole school is cameras everywhere, except for the one room they took me in to have a little chat. And uh, he asked me some, a series of questions I really can't remember. Uh, you know, who am I? Where's, can I see your license? And I said, well, the school has a copy. And he said, yeah, but that's an expired one. And I says, I tried to explain to him about the Allard action. Well, that's like explaining quasars and the MMAR to my Chinese friends. He, this policeman did not have a clue. He was not interested. And he says, well, I just want to know one thing. Do you have any pot on you? And I said, well, maybe I do and maybe I don't. I said, what do you think the probability is that I'm a patient? So he said, well, I'm going to have to take your property and search you. And 
I said, no, you can't do that. Like, I just had my school bag there, and he put his hand on the school bag, my school bag, and I said, no, 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 you can't do that. I said, that's a, you cannot take, if I have medicine, you cannot take it, because that's a crime under 262A and B of the criminal code. You're withholding medicine that may save my life. Well, he just broke into fits of laughter, grabbed my pot, twisted my cancer, my left arm, where I've had all this surgery behind my back. When he twisted my arm behind my back, the pain was so intense I thought he shot me or something I lost I don't know I, my daughter in the meanwhile who's in the same program was across the hall and it's lunchtime everybody's out and she sees mom sitting there she's wondering what's going on policeman mom I better go in and watch and she saw the takedown um, I lost consciousness I really don't remember much after that um, until I, they revived me, but apparently the CDI director assaulted my daughter and restrained her so she could not uh, come to my rescue or even see what this officer was doing to me. And I was unconscious, so I have no idea. But when I woke up, they uh, ha finished handcuffing me. They marched me out in front of the school, a couple hundred students, put me in the middle of the parking lot, smoke bombed me. I, somebody they threw a smoke bomb at the... the, the police car, there was about six cars and about 12 squad, squad, squad car members and uh, an ambulance taking me away. And uh, they strip searched me in the parking lot, made me take off most of my clothes, my socks, shoes, everything. Was it a female and police they, officer? Yeah, but there was 12 men watching right around in a little tight circle. That's a nice little violation right there. Uh, yeah, I have... I have no pride or dignity left by this time. It's okay. <laughs> Whatever. I, I'm not going to challenge these boys because this is cannabis Nazi country. You guys do not know. You come from Hippie Dippy, uh, BC or Ontario, everything's far out in New York. There are no vape lounges here. There is nothing here. This is Harper's hometown. I try to tell these people I work with, it's different here. You have no idea, no idea how hard it is for a cannabis patient. But I'm, it's okay. I'm no longer on cannabis anywhere. I had to go back to pharmaceuticals because they don't smell and they're safe and they're legal. But well, they're, that's they're what happened to me. And they they're took not. me to jail and stri oh, they stripped, made me strip to my underwear in the arresting area in front of more officers and then they put me in a cell and all I can remember about being in the cell, they locked the door and I looked up and I swore I heard music coming out of a speaker. And that's all I remember. And I, I thought, oh, well, what's strange playing music? But what happened, I, the stress had caused me to have a transglobal amnesia attack. And I really don't remember much after being put in the cell till I woke up about 8 or 9 o'clock that night in the bathtub with my grandchildren. And I started crying. I didn't know what, what had happened between those ensuing hours. That's the end of the story. So you yeah. lost 18 hours. Yeah, that time. Yeah, I've had transglobal amnesia attacks where I've lost up to 36 hours. I had one when I was at Vancouver Health Expo, Sanders Health Expo. I had just a mini one for eight hours. I was sitting there watching the booth and uh, the coalition's booth, and I walked out, and I told Ann, I said, I'm going to be back in a few minutes, and I didn't come back till the next day. And I wound up downtown at the Grierson Center or something. I had no idea where I was. I woke up, what I was doing, when I woke up, I was standing on Hastings, looking through my little purse, looking for a loony to give to this hobo on the sidewalk. And I was snooping through my purse, looking through my cards, looking for some change. And I pulled out my driver's license, and I looked at it. I remember looking at it, I thought, oh, I know that person. I thought, oh, damn, that's me. And then I realized, oh, bloody hell, I've had an attack. I'm, I don't know where I am. You don't drive, do you? Not anymore, no. Okay. I don't ever That's care. That's probably more. a good thing. No, I have a credit card with no more than five hundred dollars, so I can't get too far if I have one of these attacks. This is, mm -hmm. I know most people don't believe me, and they kind of laugh, but it's not funny. It's very, very scary to have huge gaps of time missing. But they say it's just stress related. I'm not mentally ill or anything. Is well, it, is, it a I am. is it a Who form is? of Alzheimer's or something, or? Uh, it's stress. It's called transglobal amnesia. It's triggered by stress. Google it. It's quite. There's not that much research on it. I had no idea when I first determined I had this problem. My daughter was seven months pregnant. It was a few years ago, and I was uh, looked up at her. I was just. I don't remember, but I just looked at her and I said, "You're pregnant." I'm like, who's the baby daddy? I got all upset. Well, of course I knew she was pregnant. She was seven months pregnant, but 
I knew who she was. I had no idea she was pregnant. I had no idea she even had a boyfriend. You know, and I woke up 36 hours later in the hospital. I don't remember the whole 36 hours. I've heard of so that kind of, I've heard of that kind stress. of thing being being drug induced, but ne- but never just. I think uh, it is from the years of pharmaceutical drugs. Yeah. I took uh, pharmaceuticals for many many years, okay. over twenty five years. Everything under the sun. I don't know hydromorphone, dilated methadone, everything for pain control. Wow. And I do believe that caused the liver failure, ongoing episodes of spontaneous psychosis, trying to kill myself, my kids, and the trans global amnesia. Wow. So, yeah, that, that, I really, medical. wow. Wow is really all I got to say. <laughs> yeah, that's Yeah, a, and that's I took my daughter and wow. school phone the media at that time. No, you know, anywhere else in the entire world, you have a, you know, a swarm of media. Kids are, oh, and the CDI instructor who, uh, you know, the big the director, she went around and, and threatened everybody if they said a word about this, talked about it, they would be expelled. And, um, uh, my daughter tried to tell her that's an infringement. I think it's 269 of the criminal code, uh, uh, violating the judicial process, threatening a witness, and uh, she threatened to kick my daughter out. Mind you, the school has now expelled me with a full refund, which to me is an admission of guilt and a doorway to a huge lawsuit. Yeah. So uh, where? <laughs> so now we're here today, and you, you've yeah. been you've been back in the hospital because of this several times already, right? Yeah, three times in the last eight days. So where uh, where do you think have you been charged formally? I've been charged with possession of cannabis and assaulting an officer because apparently when I went down when he when he twisted my left arm, which is the cancer side, which is the pain side, um, I lost consciousness and I think I grabbed onto his arm and I have one my fingers don't nails don't grow because of the chemo my hair finger but I have one arthritic finger where I have one long nail. And I accidentally scratched him. I think I was trying to hold on because I, my daughter says, Mommy, you were trying to hold on. You were going down and just hanging. Like I was just hanging there from his arm until he dropped me and started pummeling my sides when I was unconscious. Yeah. So I'm arrest, uh, not res- uh, assaulting an officer in possession of cannabis. Now, I went to see one lawyer here in town. No lawyer will take me. No media will show up. But one uh fellow that lives off the avails of prohibition here in town. He said he charged me six and a half thousand dollars to plead guilty, get me a conditional discharge in forty hours community work. And I said, Well for heaven's sake, I've done hundreds, thousands of hours. We don't call this work that I do with these people um, volunteer work. I already do that. And I did nothing wrong. I don't think I should plead guilty, but I can't get a lawyer in Calgary to properly represent me or anything, so and it, judges here don't even like self reps. They won't even listen to you. They'll kick you right out of the court. They call us a skirt. The self. I work with uh, um, Professor uh, Julie McFarlane at the University of Windsor, Ontario, and she, uh, 2012, she conducted a study across Canada for the judicial system on the phenomena of self reps, such as what John Tremell and that's doing. Uh, and I, I worked with her on a study. I was actually a self rep because I'm helping my daughter to self-rep her uh, outstanding Treaty 7 specific claim. She's a Treaty 7 Sarsi non-status Indian. You see, you guys don't seem to understand rights are always taken away every single day of your life. For example, this new anti-terrorism bill. Rights are very never ever restored and seldom restored if ever. Only once before in Canada have rights ever been taken away and restored. And it was when? To who? the non-status Indians, the women and their children who were discriminated against under the Indian Act, whereby an Indian man could marry anything, black, white, woman, and alien if he wanted, and bring her back to the reserve and make her a full-blooded Sarsi, whereas a woman, by that time the Sarsis were down to maybe 100 people because we had given them disease blankets to lessen our responsibility. So if my mother-in-law had married anybody else but her first cousin, she'd lose her rights to her status because she couldn't marry her band members because they weren't, but even if she married a Blackfoot, she'd cease to be a Sarsi band member and she'd be a Blackfoot band member. So the government said, oops, we shouldn't do that. That's wrong. We made a mistake. We shouldn't. And they also discriminated against Indians. If you got a university education, you lost your status and band membership. If you went to war, you lost your status and band membership. If you became a member of the clergy. So in many, many ways, they tried to lessen their responsibility. 
to get rid of their their Indian registry. We uh, in when we repatriated the Constitution, like I, I told you, I worked for Senator Harry Hayes and worked on the Constitution with Senator Harry Hayes, and he knew Ruby, my mother-in-law, because he grew up in Calgary, because his dad was the uh, from Wisconsin. He was a veterinarian, and when we signed Treaty Seven in 1877, my children's family in Starcy were put on the reserve and given cattle because. Um, they chased buffalo, and so they sent this Dr. Thomas Hayes to show them how to take care of uh, domestic cattle. And therefore, domestic uh, Thomas Hayes had a little uh, son called Harry Hayes, who became a senator, and Chief James Starlight of the Sarcy, my uh, father-in-law, my mother-in-law's father, uh, was the chief. So they worked together, and he had a daughter called Ruby Starlight, and Ruby and Harry grew up together. And he knew what happened to her. And I became his accountant and worked for him. And he used to tell me old day stories about, you know, going to see Ruby on the reserve. And he said, Nadine, he says, you've got to do something to these people. You've got to help them. You've got to get distinct, specific, rep organize and get distinct, specific representation in order to participate in the ongoing legal and political process to repatriate the Constitution and make sure that their best interests are represented when we're seeing Hey, we're going to give these rights back to these people. We don't give them back to some people who aren't non-status Indian, right? Give them back to the Métis or whoever. So I formed the Non-Status Indian Association of Alberta. We went to Ottawa. So, but anyway, this is the reason my daughter's that doing that because she's now the president of this organization. See, she's back in CDI taking that, and I'm taking this. Where I'm trying to explain this to you guys is similar to what you guys are going through. You're having a right restored. Don't forget, this cannabis hasn't been prohibited since day one, since God days, Jesus days, or whatever you call it. It's only been since the 1930s. Right. So what they're doing, it's a repatriation of a right exactly the same as the women. And I tried to teach these people, cannabis people, they might as well talk Chinese and they haven't got a clue. I said, this is a repatriation of the rights. It's the same process as a non-status union. If you don't get distinct, specific representation and organize yourself and present yourself properly in a cohesive, concise manner, they're going to walk all over you. They're going to walk all over these rights. And you know what? You think, I don't want to talk about the Conroy and Coalition, but you think that, you know what? We filed intervener status in the exact same uh, application, Google it, Sawridge Band, whatever. The same thing with the Indians happening. We had the trial to make sure it was fair because it wasn't fair because Alberta Indians, didn't want to take their women and children back because they had to share their oil revenue. The rest of Canada took all their Indians back, non-status back, because they didn't have anything. They were still getting handouts, but not in Alberta. They had when in in uh, up uh, by Enoch. As soon as you turn 18 on the Enoch Reserve, you get eighty thousand dollars, eighty grand. As soon as you turn eight out of your oil royalties, that's why there's so much drunken and craziness out there. No. But that's how much. Well, these bands don't want their people back, right? So we're both working on the repatriation of a right. Her, the non-status, me, you guys' right to consume your cannabis. Right, but the, which is also your right to consume cannabis as well. Oh, yeah, our right. That's what I mean, our right, the right, I should say. Um, let's go back to, to the cannabis here. Yeah, um, yeah. And what you were saying about Calgary, and the yeah. fact that Cal Calgary is harbor land and everything yeah. is dark. Critical here. February um, from Global News about um, Calgary opening up its first dispensary. Oh, I've never heard that. It's called the 420 Clinic. <coughs> Is on that the 9th. one on Edmonton Trail? No, that's on oh. 9th Avenue. Uh, it's probably Keith Fagan's clinic. He has immunity. He's the only one who uh, can do it. Jeff Mooj. Oh, no, I've never heard. Mooj? Jeff Muij is the director of operations, and I don't think it's Keith's. Um, no, I don't know. Uh, this one, set him up, this but one sounds know. like what it is 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 from the looks of it of how this article's written about it, it. It seems like it's it's more in line with the MMPR because yeah, I think that that's I might be the Oasis near the. I think there's one called the Oasis Clinic. It's just a doctor that signs. Oh, that's on oh, yeah, been, That's another yeah. clinic that just signs for you. But this 420 yeah. clinic is supposed to be a dispensary. I don't mean. Oh, I think no. I think I think that is Keith because Keith got. Uh, I I know he had uh, he had uh, 
Debbie and Keith Meds here. He had a I don't I, I don't uh, get involved much with that. I have no idea. Um yeah. I've been in school for the last three months, but I, mean, uh, could be. I don't know. Do, do but I don't unless he's got immunity protection, like some people in the city do with the police. You know, and you've got to realize our police chief here is running for office. He's been, instead of being a chief of police, he's been electioneering for the last two years. We've had two deaths, innocent deaths, in the last two months by police to shoot first and then ask question later. One was a diabetic patient. Oh, another patient got shot, so I felt really, really fortunate I didn't get shot. And uh, yesterday, some officer chose to leave the district office with a high-powered semi-automatic rifle in the back of his car and go to the pub. And while he was in the pub having a few pints, somebody stole his high-powered rifle. And But you know what? He's just suspended with full pay. And that's a very serious crime. So it is cannabis Nazi. This is frontier justice. So how does how did they get away with this in the city of Calgary if, if uh, Mayor Nenshi, who is supposedly the, the best mayor in Canada... How's he letting this happen? Mayor Nancy. Okay. Well, I, I don't want to say. I don't want to. I, 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 I know who trash, he's Muslim. Trash. He's, okay, I'll tell you what I know about Nancy. I'll tell you. My little olden day story about Nancy. It was 2012. Uh, we have a cannabis wellness center here in Calgary. I can send you a photo. We marched in the gay pride parade. But that was the year Nancy first got elected. It was either 2011 or 12. And we marched in the gay pride Cape Pride Parade. We had our Cannabis Wellness Center sign. Nenshi was going to be the parade marshal because he's Muslim and he's gay. But he told the Gay Pride Calgary he would not um, be in the parade if we were in the parade, the medical marijuana. So they let us be in the parade, but we were at the very, very, very end of the parade, and he was at the very, very beginning. We had probably more cheers than him. He thought it was Stampede Week. So, that, that, that sounds like a... a I don't know. That sounds like a big contradiction. Well, that's Calgary. <laughs> it's a big contradiction. Mean, any, any province, you know, they were talking about our provincial election on the radio. I had to laugh. And they said, we don't want any of these, any of these low, L intelligent 18-year-olds going out and voting. And this is why I thought, what the hell? Who, brought, who gave these conservatives a dictatorship for 50 years? These kids weren't even born then. You know, but thinking, this is how, the mentality here is very redneck. It's very, uh, well, you got a lot of money. It's, it's, it's like, you know, Wild Western, big money. But now, you know, uh, the oil drop, prices have dropped. Here I've had more clients. I'm an accountant, as you know. And I've had uh, at least one, four clients in the last two months lose their contracts. These are lucrative contracts. Quarter of a million dollars just to go around and gather data and hand it over to Suncor. It's a cushy, cushy job. And I told my client. They put some of this money away. It's not going to last forever. Well, a quarter of a million dollars every year in a nice big truck to drive around on, you know, and check some well sites. It's pretty good money. Well, it's just disappearing all over the place here. Houses are popping up for sale in the last month. Uh, um, the big oil firms have laid off, I think, 15,000 people in the last three months. Downtown Calgary. So we're hurting. Our little province is hurting really bad. We're not going to be a half problem province much longer because we have reverse electromagnetic energy and you know, Tesla energy, zero point energy. Oil and gas is going to go away the dinosaur. I have no problem. Well, oil and gas is going to have no choice because the reserves aren't going to last forever. But yeah. we're at about uh, just after the 8.30 mark. So what do you say we take a quick break? Yep. People can get a grab a okay. coffee. We'll listen to a tune. What do you got for us to, there, Al? I got some Killing Time band. It doesn't make sense, actually. There's a perfect song. I thought so. We'll be right back. This is the 420 Radio Show. Come in the chat room if you got any questions for Nadine or Marcel. Don't ask or me. Or Al. No, I don't know much, much about nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I just.
with your jacket hung up, gym shoes in the back. It's awfully stuffy, but you choose it like that with your coffee cup, orange juice, and food in your lap. Park this shitbox, the weather is beautiful. You can walk the black top and head to your cubicle. You might start to ask why the you is suitable, but stop the back talk and chew on your cuticle. Get your paycheck, try to relax, it's not fair. But that bowl that you hope that you hold is not there. Cause you know down deep in your soul you're not near. Anywhere that you wanted to go, and that's real. It's a textbook lifestyle, but who types the text? And who's a dude who chooses just what life I get? I can't begin to pretend that I figured it out. Then again, I'm not the man that be living in doubt. That's why. Yeah, we have to. Got a got a little break in between the little papers table. Just said, yeah, okay. we do. And um, uh, sorry about the echoing, but we'll we'll get a grasp on that now. And it does it now and then, and it doesn't do it all the time. Usually, when I don't turn the volume down quick enough, that's when it does it. <laughs> so we're back. It's the four twenty radio show. Marcel is out east. I'm in the middle, and Nadine is out west. Out west. She's in cowboy land. Yeah. Wild west. Yeah, and we, you know, we we were talking before we went to break, and that was Deadbeats Inc. By the way, and I I really like that, those guys. Um, Dave said that uh, he's got some new stuff coming up soon. But anyways. Um, I'm, I'm puzzled. You know, the only thing I know about the cannabis community in Calgary is from following Lisa Kirkman. Okay, I've I've mm-hmm. s- seen her trials and tribulations on what she goes mm-hmm. through and 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 all that. Um, She's been really treated badly. Yeah. Yes, she has, and and evidently you have, and and I, I'm concerned because uh, as I keep telling people every week, probably I am one of how, how many people now. We say forty, fifty thousand. Well, uh, it's kind it of hard to we say. We were up to now. almost forty thousand yeah. licenses, but then that dropped say. off because of the whole yeah. MMPR. But between the MP- MMPR and the remainder of what's in the MMAR, I'm thinking that we're probably over fifty thousand now yeah. in Canada. Yeah, and then whoever's new, you know. More being added every day mm. because of the MMPR. They're getting access it, to. Licensed 
producer like, so they can purchase it. As I mentioned, like, you know, I've had Lisa on the show. We've talked about what she's gone through. Now, she's uh, still battling with hospitals, I believe. Yeah. And she, but she has an arrangement with the school that she goes to, correct? Yeah, this yeah. is what's hilarious. If I had taken my paralegal at uh, State, they don't have the same program, though, the one that I want. Uh -huh. She actually took her vaporizer into the lounge at school yeah. and lit it up and used it and yeah. went on TV. She's got good media support, and yeah. uh, yeah. I don't think she had the SWAT team sent down to her. Well, I mean, yeah. and that's that's what I'm getting at, Nadine. I mean, it, it. You're right. I'm in Ontario. I live up north. I'm in a cushy little place. I'm in in housing, and I I have my license too. And mm -hmm. and I I worry about getting pulled over or or the cops coming yep. through my door too. Um, we're all in this uh, quandra together, mm -hmm. right? And uh, Calgary's kind of. I keep saying Canada's going backwards, but I think Can uh, Calgary's kind of in the Stone Age still, eh? Well, we were, we're in the black hole, dear. We we're, we're in a pit, mm. a pit of ignorance and apathy. Why, why that, do you think that is? That pit of ignorance and apathy is right across the country, though. Yeah, and, but... It's, it's and the problem is, is, is 80 years of prohibition has driven it extremely well into people's minds and, and main, or their main way of thinking well what I, mean, I find is people want to know about it but are afraid to ask because of their ramifications yes, look right. what happened in school the little yeah. chinese kid asked me we talked about it look what happened uh for example when i was at the hospital today i uh they know i'm a medical cannabis patient and they know i keep showing up on their doorstep every three days throwing up and half dead is because of what happened to me and it's like a big joke and I told this one doctor as I was leaving, um, I said, he's, whoa, go get this pills and that pills. And I said, but my doctor has now told me they don't want to see me anymore because of this, what's happened here. So you know? you've been basically fired by your doctor. Yeah. And I, yeah. I have a friend here in, in town here, Kelly, who actually does a show on the, on the air here. And uh, she, last year, her doctor fired her because she walked into his office with uh, some RSO to show him and to make, sure, make it all legal and stuff like that. Because that's what I did with my doctor. I walked in. I showed him what I was taking. He's got photocopies of everything. He's okay with it. He asks me about dosing this, information. These doctors wouldn't even go there. They'd phone the police. They, you, uh, it's, it's, yeah, I wouldn't even dare do that. It's ridiculous. No. You know, they would have I mean, security. Call security. Uh, be out of there in a heartbeat. <laughs> well, Different. I got a phone call today from a police officer. Yeah. And it was to give me an update on an ongoing case. But more importantly, it was to thank me for providing with him with so much information because he had no clue about the medicinal benefits of cannabis and he's now teaching all of his fellow officers and friends wow. that this actually is a medicine that can save somebody's life and how this happened was somebody got in trouble yeah somebody got in trouble somebody but... tried to rip off a patient yeah oh. They tried to rip off, well, they succeeded ripping off the patient, but they succeeded even more getting a shit kicking when they came back for more. Yeah, so it took oh. it took that event for somebody to, to ask enough questions yeah. about something that is the number one topic in mainstream media around the world the way they want to put it out there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, as a police officer, he's he's taught this is the law, this is how you yeah, enforce well, it. That's their job, to enforce the law. Yeah. Now, what also has to come in play is a little bit of logic on that police officer's part and some common sense. Because when they look at, a, a especially with medicinal cannabis, because it's been so widely publicized with the, the ongoing court cases, the fact that you know, Global Mail puts out headlines saying the MMPR is going to be a $3 billion business and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. These cops have to know that it's medicine and they can't treat patients the same as some high school kid. Yeah. 
because we're not. The average age, and I think it was in the 70s, the average age of, of cannabis user was, was between 20 and 30. Uh, I don't know about that. that. I think that's what the average age was then. The average age now for cannabis users is, is 50 to 60. Probably the same people. The, the, it, well, uh, likely it is. The, wait, back up a second, okay? You, you, you've got my dyslexic mind going here. That's fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm good at that. <laughs> in the 70s, I'm 51, so how old was I, say, in 74? Uh, 13 or 14. Okay, so I was I was running around Europe at that time, and I, with my parents, well, well with my mom, and... Um, sitting in hash bars and you know things like that wow. doing the whole european vacation thing when i came back i mean i'm a victim of toronto i grew up in right down in downtown i went to jesse ketchum which is the big huge public school right in the center of the you mm -hmm. know bay and bluer kind of thing and i mean i i happened to be able to wander around yorkville old yorkville and you could smell it you could wow. smell it on Young Street. We used to walk up and down Young Street four or five times every weekend. Friday, Saturday night, we'd be out there walking up and down till we got our licenses. Then we were squealing up and down. You know how that works, right, Marcel? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, but, but see, I grew up in, in Dartmouth and Halifax yeah. at the same time period, and you could always smell it then, but usually yeah. it was coming off of me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't start smoking until I was 19. Till you were what? Till I was 19, but, uh, you know, the story I like to tell, at 16, my doctor told me that I should be smoking pot instead of taking Ritalin, so... Well, uh, yeah, and you know, if, it probably would have helped you a lot more. Lot I, more. You know what? It took me three more years to actually, uh, you know, start smoking. Uh, I was drinking, you know, doing the, the teenage chips yeah. beer party all night thing, yeah. and... and uh, but when I went off the riddle in, uh, the option was there. Even well, see, then. I was using it at that age What for what I thought was rebellion and recreational, only to later find out it was all medicinal to keep me from being put on Ritalin. Well, yeah. Mental well-being, yeah. Yeah. Pretty yeah. much. I wish, yeah. I wish, I mean, I smelt it in the house. Uh, I, I've smoked with my mom many, many times over the years. I know that she smoked when I was younger, and there's nothing wrong with that even today. Uh, Not at all. Uh, but it was a different time then. Uh, it was well, it was okay, but it was illegal, and as long as nobody knew uh, or smelt it, you were good. And it's kind of rem remnants. Is it a remnants? R rem reminiscence. Reminiscence of what's happening now because... Yeah. Um, you know, I'm always worried about the smell, and, and and that's what this is about. It's about the smell, and there's been a lot of yeah. articles coming out of the states about the same topic. You know, and yeah. and that's basically what started this for you was was the smell. I mean, the, well, I, mm -hmm. I live in. So I, my I, solution has always been, yeah, for the last few years, to use concentrates. I yeah. do. I have a eucalyptus oil and peppermint concentrate I carry with me everywhere. And you know what? You either smell cannabis or you smell eucalyptus. It doesn't no, no, matter. I, no. I mean, use concentrated cannabis, not plant, plant, plant matter, because it's the plant that really has that really strong stink yeah. to it. Yeah. I have Extracts a, such as yeah. oils and hash yeah. do not do not have the same smell as the plant they come off of. Yeah, but they're not legal. I, I would rather get caught with a little bag of pot than a whole bag of medibles and candies in this town. I would rather get caught with the medibles and, and candies because it would be a much better charter challenge. Ask well, Owen yeah. Smith and the Supreme yeah. Court of Canada. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, actually, I had some candies and they took my purse and I had a little vape pen in there full of pot. They didn't take it. They didn't even see it because it was in with my pencils. And... Uh, I had a whole bag of see, Sam's so that, candy, Sam Malachi's candies in my purse, and they never left them. I had them in there with my mint and gum and stuff like that. They didn't even see it. They didn't no. have a clue. Yeah. But we've had the same thing that with police raids to dispensaries down here where they've, they've taken all kinds of, of stuff, mm -hmm. but then turned around and left full jars of bud sitting yeah. on shelves. Wow. Right? So. <laughs> well, I think they just get excited. Oh, look at this. Ooh. 
<laughs> the um, okay. the concentrate. I like the the idea of the concentrates for mm-hmm. people to smoke the concentrates, uh, for the smokers to smoke concentrates because I don't like the smell of burning plant. I I don't like the smell of pot. Oh, I love it. It's you my can. air. It's I don't my like it anymore. Freshener. I mean, it, I've used so much every day that I've grown to hate the taste and smell. Not me. I love it. Concentrates. I don't have that issue. Well, I can't say that because I smudge uh, with sweet grass and sage with my children, and we use burning plants as part of our uh, traditional ceremonies. So I don't. Know, yeah. I don't mind smudging the smell from smudging. I don't <laughs> like the smell of pot. Can I tell you an olden day story about uh, my mother-in-law and her father? When my mother-in-law, she's the daughter of the hereditary chief Starlight, and when I was moving her from her apartment into an old folks home, I was helping her tidy up and put all her stuff away, and I found this little bundle in her drawer. It was like a hobo sack, little, uh, like a leather white, it was Kootenai tanned white, because her hide, because her... Her dad used to go into the Kootenays and trade with the Kootenay Indians, and he'd bring back this beautiful white hide. And it was a little uh, medicine bag. And I, I said, oh, Ruby, I said, what's this? She said, oh, no, no, my girl, don't open that. She said, that's my father's medicine bag. And I said, well, what's in it? She says, well, we can't look. She wouldn't, She didn't want to look. But in their beliefs, they uh, this was her dad's medicine bag. So we opened it. And in this med- little leather pouch were five little uh, canvasy, like uh, hemp type fiber, really rough cotton, little old faded white hobo sacks. And we opened each one, and it, one had little dark berries. One had little something looked like mushrooms, dried mushrooms. And one, I swear to God, I said, Ruby, your dad has cannabis in here. She said, oh no, no, my girl, my father would never touch that. And I said, Ruby, this is pot. <laughs> I don't know what all the other stuff, the other five one, but I was sure. But it was really, it was like, this stuff must have been 100 years old. It was really dry and powdery. But it just reminded me of that stuff at the bottom of the bag. So anyway, we put the bundle away. And I and as I was moving her, I went into her medicine cabinet. And uh, she had all these old bottles from the 1920s and 30s, little glass bottles with rubber tops in it. And I said, Ruby, you've got an arsenal of pills in here. Oh, no, no, my girl, she says, uh, cousin uh, um, uh, Olaf on the reserve gave her these pills, and it's for my stomach, and it's for my liver. But because in the Indian way, and her dad's medicine bag was so powerful because it's been handed down from generation to generation and from tribe to tribe. And the more you, the older a medicine bag is, and the more it's passed around, the more power it has because it retains the energy of its owners, right? And which they use in healing. Now she took that thinking, twisted logic, into her pharmacy cupboard, and she applied that because cousin Olive gave it to you know Auntie Mary Jane, and on and on that this liver pill was really good and never be thrown out. This is how different. So, so that so she never took these pills. Well. I hope not, but they were there to be taken if her liver or her stomach or her heart or her back or whatever they were for. You know, cousin right. Sons said they were, this is now, they don't know. But they now knew. the problem with the cannabis in the bag over a long period of time is the THC degrades. Yeah. Down to C B down to C B N. Does C B so do the C B D S as well? Extremely medicinable. <laughs> but I just wanted to point out that this type of cannabis medicine was in my children's ancestry. You know, I would like my daughter to have the courage to say, no, I am a Sarsi Indian. My grandmother and my great-grandfather, we used this in medicine probably along with peyote buttons and whatever they else they did. But that's what they did. You know, who are we to judge? Her uh, Dick Starlight, her other great-grandfather was a powerful medicine, Blackfoot medicine man. I got pictures, you know, those kind of Indians with the horns coming out of their head. Yeah, it's my kid's family. So this t- us being involved in this type of medicine is not unusual. Oh, I agree. I, I mean, tried peyote this, this once. This has been used as a medicine for <laughs> thousands and thousands of years by almost every culture on the planet. Uh-huh. Well, that's what, in Genesis, isn't it? In the first chapter of Genesis, I've given you every plant you need, you know, and it's it's here. I, I could. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, for all of the ones that believe in the Bible. It's it's also in your Bible. <clears throat> it's, so it's 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 in the Torah as well. Yeah, it's, it's actually in pretty much every religious writing. 
uh, including the Quran? I, I believe it is, but I don't think it's in Scientology. <laughs> we should we should find somebody yeah. who would know that. Yeah, we should find. It. All right, we got to find Scientologists. All right, if you're a Scientologist and you're listening, send us an email or or a message or something. Let us know what Scientology's views are on cannabis as a medicine. Um, hey, but especially Mar now. Hey, Marcel. Yeah. I kind of highly doubt there's going to be somebody of Scientology faith listening to a show with two pothead patients talking to a lady about an event that the, that involved the police. I just don't see it. Yeah, I can't see it either, but you never know. Maybe somebody, <laughs> one of our listeners, will send it to one of their Scientology friends. Yeah. I don't know. I, I doubt, haven't even but, seen anybody on Facebook that uses Scientology. I mean, in a it's a serious question, though. I'm I'm it curious is. to know if there are any religions. Now, I'm not. I don't want to get into a religious debate. I'm just curious if there's any religions that do not accept cannabis as a medicine or some yeah. sort of sacrament. Or it, they may not accept it now, but in their religious writings, was it ever? Yeah. Yeah. Is the better question? Yeah, because yeah, they won't accept it because of the criminal code. That's, we should we should uh, find some clergy to talk to about uh, the religious aspects of uh, you know get maybe get a priest and a Jew and a rab mm -hmm. you know a priest and a rabbi and a <laughs> if we got the makings for our own joke, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> rabbi and the monk came in. <laughs> there's 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 a priest, a rabbi, and a nun all on a pot show. <laughs> 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 but I mean, we've got uh, a, a number of the states have religious. I, that would freedoms. work, you know. That would work. Right. But I a number of the so. states have religious <laughs> freedoms now for opening up to having a, a church with a cannabis base. Uh, Canada's I, had the challenges in court for a number of years. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, the Vatican's the, not that uh, not all that on top of it, though, are they? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think they're a little busy with pedophiles. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, they they seem to be really busy trying to clean up that crap. Um, but then look at the Rastafarian. Yep. There's there's their whole that whole religion and culture is based on cannabis. Yes. Yes. Right. As a prime example. But it, yeah, I'd be interested to know what Scientology's view is on cannabis as a medicine. Hey, I got an idea. Let's Google it. We should. Scientology. You, you, Scientology. And Hillary in the chat room just told me, Church of the Universe. That was the one I was trying to remember. Mm -hmm. That's that's Scientology? No, that's the Medicinal Cannabis Church. I belong to oh. it. <laughs> I remember. Oh, my Facebook friend, anyway. Okay, I I'm just, in, I'm Googling got Scientology. A lot of things interesting things to say. The truth about marijuana. This mm -hmm. is from Scientology.ca. Let's see what they say here. Oh, there we go. We're gonna get our own now, if there's any music or anything answer. like that, I apologize because there's a video loading. And Hopefully we won't hear it. Well, you, you might. I don't want to. I don't want to either, so I'm going to turn it right down. Okay. So, uh, this is the Scientology video channel, and I'm watching a video, and it's called The Truth About Marijuana, and I'm going to post the video in our page. Um, it's This documentary is the real story of, of what drugs are and what they do to one's body and mind. Told by people who have been there, done that, and survived it. Survived it. Yeah. So I yeah. like I like that. Survived I, it. This and the cat video category is anti drug. So you know what? I'm gonna back this up here just one second here. Probably gonna get in trouble for this, but sticky marijuana. I ended up being addicted to heroin, coke, meth. I've done it all. And it all started with pot. <laughs> Well, that <laughs> kind of says it all right there, I think. Answered yeah. that question. <laughs> Notice he didn't talk about the severe brain trauma that he suffered before all of that. Right? <laughs> you know, I get a kick. I, 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 I 
tend to stay up and watch the late night shows, and and every now and then you hear that commercial. Hi, my name is Bubba Bubba, and I used to be an addict. Yeah, I used to be an addict. I, I'm sorry, I was always taught that once you're an addict, you're always an addict. Yeah, it drives me nuts. I, I've lost. I'm not an addict. I'm not an addict. No, I'm not. No, I'm not an addict. If, if well, I'm a, I'm I'll, an addict to living in good health. Yeah, if if I, I, I got addicted to relief. If if wanting a pain free day without grumpiness, lots of happiness, and mm-hmm. good food at the end of it, uh, I'll take that. Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> for the ones that claim that cannabis makes people violent. Well, that's only true to a point. Yes, it makes them violent, but only towards a bag of chips. Speaking of which, you know, I've I've d- developed a real hankering for the president's choice chips, rippled, really plain, the basic plain. basic no name chip. Yeah, yeah, that's all you need. I mean, make your own. Make my own. Make Dude, your own. I'm single. I don't do things like that. Oh. No, I go to the store and I buy chips. I used to be single and I used to do things like that. Yeah, like well, food. <laughs> I like to bake stuff. I don't, you know, make chips and stuff like that. Oh. I, I tend not to eat a lot of fried foods, but I like chips. Anyways, enough about me. Yes. So... <laughs> <laughs> so, so Nadine. Let's yes. get back. Let's get back to you and and what's happening with you. So now you're in the process of trying to find uh, a lawyer, legal, legal representation that has a brain, <laughs> yeah, and is not going to gouge you, yeah. Um, is that possible in Calgary? Well, I don't know. I was approached by <clears throat> a firm, Dunn and Associates. It's a big firm, international firm. They got uh, organ uh, agencies all over, firms all over. I was supposed to meet with him today, but he had court and I got sick, so we decided we will meet Monday. And he is the very first lawyer that has understood that this is a charter challenge. You know, if, uh, if Manson ever gets around to ordering interveners, we would have a great what position to uh, make an application for intervener status in the Allard action and bring some of this new evidence in. Yeah, but they won't call for an intervener until it yeah, goes to the next maybe, court. Maybe call. not. I think they will. What I was telling you about the Indians, the non-status, we filed an application in 1987 and it is still in court now. So these right. things can go for 30 but, years, no problem. We're not even going to be alive when this thing's resolved in court. Yeah, but normally when they call for a political for solution and a legal solution, we're only we're not getting a political. See, we've got a problem here. Like I work with Senator Hayes, and I work, I know this stuff inside out. You, you have, um, you know, we're looking for a legal solution, but the political will is not there, right? Uh, I think it may come with this next election if we can get Young Trudeau in there and and you know keep his fingers out of the cannabis cookie jar and keep him clean with his. Oh, that ain't gonna like, happen though. He ain't gonna keep his well, fingers out maybe. of it. Well, maybe. Well, then if you can't keep it clean, keep it covered up really good. Get a damn good forensic auditor in there and keep you know, cover up your muddy tracks. Don't well, no, no. Well, but it, is there anything? Re- is there really any, any? Okay, look. I mean, I'm not a big fan of of these changes. Uh, I'm a patient and I have a hard time getting my meds. I I can't grow my own, you know, blah, 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 blah. If Trudeau's getting, uh, was to get in, I've heard wind now that he's considering six plant minimum or maximum, well, sorry. Uh, like the Colorado model, you mean two, two, the, six plants per person, two, per, two adults per house type of thing? I don't, I don't, I don't know any more details than that. Do you know any, anything about that, Marcel? Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you guys. I was on the Liberal Party of Canada's uh, policy committee here up until last September, August, September, because I got in a row with them. We had a big teleconference policy meeting, and they were dictating some little girl, I don't know who it is, in Ottawa, saying, oh, this is our marijuana policy. And I said, well, uh, don't we get the democratic right to have input? Aren't we the policy committee? And basically, I got excommunicated from that committee. I've never been heard back from since. And their policy was 
pretty uh, archaic and not um, not uh, adequate for our needs. The political will is not there. I don't care whose party gets in. I don't care who gets in. The political will has to be there as well as the judicial and legal processes to make sure that if they do get the political will, that they do it according to you know the generally accepted principles and procedures that, that govern all of us, oil company, cannabis, food, whatever, ranching, we all do it the same. We're all playing on the same level f playing field. And one thing before we go tonight, I want to talk about ca Health Canada's own cost-benefit analysis into the MMPR. Please do. Like I always liken it to the Indians because it's the only time we're ever going to get rights restored. <clears throat> is uh, your disease blanket is the MMPR and the Health Canada's own cost benefit analysis into the MMPR they clearly state they expect a 400 percent end cost to the users and this shall result in no less than a 30 percent decline in the amount of cannabis patients sure the number under the MMPR are growing but all they can do is buy uh, you know, whatever, send biotech or whatever they're putting out and it's all moldy and it's no good and, and it's not organically grown strain specific to meet your needs, and right? Treat, and treat it with radiation. Yeah, and radiated, fortified and enriched. No salt know? and pepper? <laughs> Pardon me? No salt and pepper? No salt. So what I want to say is that this is called financial genocide. We gave the Indians disease blankets. They gave you the MMPR, but it's financial genocide because I'm going to tell you, you have three healths, right? Fundamental health. You have your mental health, physical health, and your spiritual health, and they're all inextricably related. But you know what? Health is the most important. Trumps them all. Your financial health. Because as soon as you lose your ability to pay your debts as they fall due or generate adequate income, you will get a headache, stomach ache, and curse God for your misfortune. And there goes all of your health. Now, when that Health Canada says it's going to be a 400% increase cost to the end user, that is called financial genocide. We know these people are patients. Their Canada pensions aren't going to cover this. They're going to have to take money from their rent, from their food. I, from their I, I, well-being to pay for this uh -huh. or go back on drugs. That's financial genocide. Yeah, Pretty I much. mean, it, it. Yeah, I mean, I I pay uh, Mary to feed Paul, kind of thing. You know, uh, I I have to decide: uh, am I going to eat light this week, or am I going to yeah. have medicine? You know, um, it 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 usually the medicine wins. But if you're on pharmaceuticals, they'd be insured, delivered, yep. everything there, yep. right? Yep. So I, oh, bloody hell, you can make money, you get run out of money, you can sell a tile and all have five dollars. That's how no. great it is. And you didn't have to pay a farthing to get them. And that is what's going on in this world. And we it better is. wake up. We don't think that's not what's going on. So what I told the doctor at the, the hospital that I said, you're the drug dealers. You're the, I said, these people are called, what you called, Drug dealers are called cannabis phytotherapists. They know the strain specifics. They know what's what for what. I said, all those drugs out on the street, these 500 fentanyl you found on this poor kid that's killing all the Indians on the reserve, where did they come from? Are your oxycodones and stuff like that? You're the drug dealers. Tylenol 4. He didn't appreciate that. But, and I, I, I got, I, he got upset, and I said, I'm trying to use this as a teaching moment. Whenever I try to explain what's going on with an allergy action or why I smell like pot. I try to educate people. And I think that's what we've got to do is constantly educate people everywhere we go, standing in the shopping line. I turn around and I'll apologize. Are you know, in the queue to pay for your food? I'll, I know I smell like cannabis. I apologize. I'll say, I'm sorry. I may smell like cannabis, but I am a medical cannabis patient. Oh, well, my grandma needs it, you know, and use it as a teaching moment. <laughs> I do do that. Even though I don't smell like cannabis when I'm in line, I do the same thing, and I've done it many times. Oh, yeah. um, the thing that I find most fascinating is usually the look on people's faces yeah. when I say cannabis, and they look at me quizzically, and then I say marijuana. Yeah. But I'm not whispering. And that's what throws them off because I make sure that if they hear it, everybody else around us can hear it at the same time. Intelligent, professional manner. Exactly. Let's yeah. get rid of the reefer madness. 
Mm-hmm. My doctor's office loves it when I go in and sit there for an hour. Speak, so they try you know, to make sure that I don't sit there for an hour. <laughs> speaking of re- oh, reefer When madness. you started this conversation, you mentioned it's a mentality. Everybody yeah. you know, talks quietly about That's uh-huh. reefer madness. It is. You know, it is. Reefer madness does not have you – know, you know, there is a science behind reefer madness. You know what? That's, sure it's not cannabis science. It's called the science of linguistics. It's the syntax of the word. It's t- abrogating and derogating the meaning of a word. Instead of, you know, a cannabis phytotherapist, which you probably were called a hundred years ago, you're a pot dealer, right? That is taking um, words to manipulate. You know, Hitler was a great man at that. To manipulate, you know, he said, if you tell a lie long enough and big enough, people will believe it. Well, look at how it's look how well it's worked for Stephen Harper. He believes them. Har- yeah. Harper's been lying so much that he now believes everything he's yeah. saying. Harper, Hitler, what's variations of the same theme? Different, different show. <laughs> different show. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Actually, I've done the numerology on both the names, and uh, they're very similar. We've got exactly the same life path number and everything. It's scary. Anyway. I ha- see. I have a different attitude, and and because I realized what has to be done, and the only sensible solution is to get a government with enough balls to stand up to the corporate powers to say no, this is enough, and remove cannabis from the CDSA. Yeah, it's not the medicinal benefits that is the problem. It's the economic rewards. It's the economic benefits. Corporate exactly. Warfare. It's it's and it's an asymmetrical corporate warfare. It's the damage that would be done to the oil industry, the plastic industry, the cotton industry, the forestry industry, all of those well, industries. We're already hurting enough here with low oil prices. We certainly don't need cannabis replacing it. My right. poor clients, what are they going to do? Lose the yeah, 250 yeah. grand in their big truck Ram Charger? So there. so what if canna- using cannabis as a hemp fuel is better for the environment than using a carbon-based fuel? Who cares? We, yeah. know, we have the oil sands and stuff like that. Who cares if we destroy a few thousand acres of land and have yeah. three headed fish? We don't need to have any land in a few hundred years because we can destroy, destroy the whole planet and we'll let those people worry about it, right? Or we could just blow it up. How? What a conservative I, or, uh, uh, <laughs> way of thinking, I guess. <laughs> it oh, that's progressive conservative. conservative, not conservative to you, sir. No, that's... Don't That's forget, a, it's progressive conservative. <laughs> well, here. no, isn't, isn't it actually called the Harper government now? Yeah. So yeah. it's it's more like a dictatorship than anything, I guess. Well, he but, has a dictatorship. Okay. That's what a majority is. A different show. The MMAR was forced, was not, well, actually it was forced. The MMAR was, was forced onto the government of Canada by the courts. Yeah. Yes. It would not be a if it was will not to uphold for... the court's decision. Yes. Right. Now, the government had to implement the MMAR. When they implemented it, they designed it to fail. Yeah. And the problem is it didn't fail because the patients made it work yeah. through various court cases such as Hitzig and things like that. Parker. Because they couldn't get the MMAR to fail... And they were up to almost forty thousand registered patients and growers. They had no choice but to trash it and come up with the MMPR, so that it could be a program that could fail as well. Yeah. And the failure would be trying to push patients into property because they've taken away their rights to grow. Yeah. They're going to lose that one too. So eventually, the government has to wake up and realize that having cannabis. A is doing nothing to help Canada or Canadians hurt them in all forms. So I mean, it's 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 a long uphill battle, and the court cases will only get to the point where the cannabis laws are of no force and effect. Well, that you're, but we're, there's we're, still we're, the law until it's removed from the CDSA. We're seeing that happen in the states right now. Right, I it, mean, that's it, exactly what's happening yeah, in the states. Yeah, we're see, we're watching it happen, and and a lot of people thought it was going to happen here, but we're going backwards. Um, I I want to bring up two things. Uh, on on the nineteenth, on April nineteenth, there's a new series on CNN called High Prof High Profits, 
uh, it and it's uh, cat- cannabis meets capital capitalism kind of thing. Oh, cool! And uh, they're also having uh, weeds three or weed three with Dr. Gupta there on that night too. I don't, I'm not sure what time though. So, just see, there's sure there's that. a good example, Sanjay Gupta. I'd love to talk to him. I, I'd, love, man, I'd love. I'd love for him. The man was totally against cannabis yes. until he started researching it. Yes. But he did but the research. But you know research. what I say about Gupta? He did the research. It's though. not rocket science to research cannabis. And if he was wrong about cannabis, which is so fundamental, you can ask most fifteen-year-old; they'll know more about it than him. He scares me. What? Did he, what else are you wrong about, Gupta? But that's. You know? I mean, that's typical of of anybody <clears throat> in anything. Um, no, not necessarily. Get your facts straight before you go spouting off things. And then for something that significant, it's like, oops, I didn't do my research. Well, what other stuff are you peddling? Dr. Why you Oz did the what? same thing. He was totally against it. Now he's for it. Right. So the problem is... It's it's mainstream media jumping on board the the traffic jam that is cannabis in the world. Yeah. The... Traffic jam. Government yeah. will fund a study to say cannabis is bad and the media will run it Yes, and people like Sanjay was before would assume that that must be true because you know it's a, a study that was funded by the government and so it must be a, a valid study also right. because of the prohibition and the restrictions placed on researching cannabis in North America very little studies have ever been done so a lot of the study material that we use is coming out of places like Israel yeah 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 because they've been doing the research where we basically give that information to our politicians and say see every time you say there's no studies you're a liar yeah because we know the studies are there a, a good example is in the storm crows list there's over a thousand pages of links to to studies and articles about the medicinal benefits of cannabis for pretty much any disease ever imaginable the studies are done it's just a matter of looking for them well uh, the canary study that real kapler was trying to uh, had initiated here in canada with cannabis patients all of a sudden got her funding pulled and we're trying to raise funds for her for that you know, and it was a fantastic study, but now they, her funding source has ceased to fund that. Really, I don't, Did you know about the canary study that was going on here in Canada? No, not in Canada, but I knew of a canary that was being done in... It actually was done you a few years ago. You want to have her on your show. She's a very interesting lady. Um, they uh, started... Basically, I think it was more... I know I took part of the study. Every cannabis patient I know this pretty well in the MMAR took it. That was halfway through, and then all of a sudden, I think it because it was so successful, they put you know it was showing the uh, uh, giving them the feedback they did not want to see. They were hoping maybe some negative stuff, but it was just so fantastic. They shut that study down, and that was just initiated last year and shut down just this year, like 2014. I recently put out a survey here um, for the MCPAC. Um, in regard uh, cost analysis for MMAR or like for medicinal Canada um, and I'm just going to pull it up and I'll give you an example one of the questions that I'd asked is a very simple question as soon as I scroll down give me one moment and the question is Alex the question is, in your opinion, has your health and quality of life improved since you started using cannabis as a medicine? Mm-hmm. And the options were, I'm only alive because of it, greatly improved, somewhat improved, no real change, and I got worse. The majority at 61% is greatly improved. 30% for I'm only alive because of it, and 9% for somewhat improved. And not a single answer for no real change or I got worse. Wow. All right. So every person that is that is filled out this survey and has used cannabis as a medicine 
has seen improvement for their condition. And this is what those government studies, government sanctioned studies, and pharmaceutical sanctioned studies don't want people to know. That's true. I, I would never have been able to go back to school if I was on pharmaceuticals. The only reason I could go back and even hope to get my JD or LLB is because I am on cannabis. Well, I wouldn't be doing this show if it wasn't for cannabis. No doubt. Because I wouldn't be here to do it. So it's 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 a matter of, of trying to educate the people that don't know. And the ones that need to be educated first and foremost are the ones that vote. And sadly, that is our senior citizens who've had the majority of prohibition lies pounded into them. Yes. You know, my right? my mom's actually just coming around. You know, more she she had uh, a, a get together and slowly but surely through the conversation it t slowly went to cannabis and yeah. and uh she found it actually kind of interesting i think that it was doing that cuz she's always been uh, alan my my friend's got cancer and he's getting going through chemo and yada yada i was well you know tell him this or tell him to look at my website or you know blah 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 you know or say hello i give him some information that may help him or at least make him more comfortable right and yeah. um but now she's having she's bringing it up <laughs> now my mom's an educator she's a retired vice principal she's a retired special ed uh teacher so i mean she's slowly but surely uh, trying to help senior citizens and unknowingly bringing up something that that is a really hot topic but a lot of people are really scared to talk about it. Well, it's, again, it, it's because of how well of a job Prohibition Lies did yeah. on our public. I mean, we have kids in school that I would say right now is probably about 50, 50, 50% 50 of the kids in school know the medicinal benefits and, or know that cannabis can be used as a medicine while another 50, the other 50% think that it's a gateway drug and is going to lead you to insanity and everything else because that's what the more media and their parents portray it as. Yeah. My first major uh, project that I did in, in, in uh, public school was about cannabis. Well, sorry, then we called it marijuana. Um and my my dad who was a physician uh helped me with it so that i got all the correct information took me to the library yada 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 helped me do the charts and all that but now at 76 i think now with full blown parkinsons uh in a wheelchair he tells me he doesn't want to be controlled the way cannabis controls people and i don't get that but How does it control people? It, it allows them to think outside the box I instead of in that little bubble. He is a psychiatrist, and oh. he is a specialist in behavior modification, a specialist in light therapy, and pills. That's what oh. his business. That's what he did, and and now this 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 plant, this drug that everybody has heard about, stay away from. It's the devil's the devils now you know. i've met and talked to several people that are very much involved in the mental health whether yeah um psychiatrist therapist etc well, that we've we've are had adamant that cannabis should be used as a first treatment for things such as ptsd and depression yes we've had uh, peter forenses from cam h in toronto uh on yep. to talk about mental health and cannabis and although he'll tell you flat out, uh, is it addicting? Mm -hmm. You know, we already had that conversation. Uh, if you're addicted to health, I guess it's addicting. But um, it's it, there are some people that shouldn't use it, just like there are some people that shouldn't use Wellbutrin or or Zoloft or you know what I mean. 
it's it's it it it's all patient specific, just like the pills. And once people get past that, it's a marijuana cigarette. You're just gonna get high and fucked up and want to eat chips. You know. Yeah. And, see, uh, I I. I end up teaching a lot of patients with what I do, and, and I teach them all the same way. Start very small so you don't feel it. Yep. And then work your dose up over time the same as you would do for any other medication that you're prescribed or what you should do for any yep. other medication that is prescribed. Okay, let, let me ask you a question. When I grew up, I was always told that the first time I smoked a joint, I wouldn't feel it. I wouldn't know what, you know, it wouldn't do any different. Now, do, do, and that kind of happened, but do you think that that would be because of our our cannabinoids that we already have going on in our in our system? Could be possible, but I've seen people that their first time Get right been knocked right off their asses. Yeah. 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 I think it depends on the product, probably in your environment, too. Yeah. how much they're using and their frame of mind. Yeah. Because don't forget, when you're using cannabis illegally, you have the worry uh, all the time. Uh, the worry. Well, it's the side effect of paranoia. Yeah. Yes, yes, and it's all enhanced right, because, because it can. You know you're doing something. Yeah, you're doing something wrong. Don't do that. Right. So that that is also a side effect for the early start when you're illegal. As soon as you're you're legal, you don't have that paranoia problem because you don't uh, really give a shit. I gotta say that that I, I don't agree with that one, Marcel. Because no, the I, paranoia, you can still get anxiety. I got it bad every time I go down to the dispensary. Okay? Mm. Because mm. I've got a three hour drive that I Because you're tr- going to a dispensary yes. which is not a legal outlet. No, I'm not talking about the fact that I'm going into a dispensary. I'm talking about the fact that I then have to drive three hours from the city home and worry about getting pulled over. Excuse me, why do I smell pot? <laughs> and now see Again, because I'm legal, that's not an issue for me. But it is if I'm driving a car and an officer pulls me over and says, I smell marijuana, please step out of the car because I'm an asshole. Haven't you heard? Oh, yeah, but <laughs> it's great to be an asshole, but go ahead and do a roadside sobriety test. And that's exactly what I would do. Right. Okay. And you would pass a roadside sobriety test. No, I would not. And I'll tell you why. Because I have an inner ear problem. There ain't no way I'm going to be able to get through that test. Ah, then that's a medical condition that's not affected by the cannabis. So regardless, if you were drunk or, or sober, you would still have that same problem. I have multiple sclerosis. Do you think I'm going to do a roadside sobriety test without my cane? So what would happen <laughs> if I refuse? You don't refuse. You just go ahead and do it. And they explain you have a, a, a problem with your inner ear, and, and that's why you're prescribed cannabis. And you'd be more than happy to do a roadside sobriety test. But it ain't gonna do nothing. But make me look like an idiot. And make him look like an idiot because he's not gonna. You're not gonna be showing as impaired, too impaired to drive. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. <laughs> the conversation that I had with the police officer today was hilarious because I I had said to him, you know. In the 1920s, if you were a cop and you got sick and went to the cannabis as a medicine, mm-hmm. I said, and they, you would go back to work and you would be fine and you would do your job and everything would be well. Now they tell you if you do that, you're impaired. Yet you can go to work on antidepressants and was, narcotics. Yeah. yeah, I'm allowed to drive on Wellbutrin. You or, shouldn't or, be. Hey, I'm allowed to drive on Ritalin, man. <laughs> yeah, and you shouldn't be because Wellbutrin and Ritalin are both a mind-altering drug. That's that's right. All right. Yep. They're designed to, to yet, alter your mind. But so yet they'll how take, can they'll cough take, syrup will do the same thing? They'll take your license away from you if you have epilepsy or or even severe diabetes. Mm-hmm. I took I took my own license away mm-hmm. just to save everybody else. Well, okay, but. You wouldn't want me on the roads if I wasn't using cannabis, because then it would just be dangerous. But you know, there come the, uh, anybody with any sense would would pull them, themselves off the road. I would think, you know, if if they feel impaired. But that's the advantage. If if somebody's high on cannabis, they know if they're imp- too impaired to drive or not. 
to begin with. I, but I don't every study like that's driving, been huh? done with drivers and cannabis has shown that the drivers are better drivers. Yeah, because we're too damn paranoid not to be. It's not that we're paranoid. We're more <laughs> attentive. We can actually process the information faster of everything that's around us. Yeah. So we can we're thinking faster ahead of time. Now, is there is there documented proof on that? There was a study done in England um, a few years ago, and I could probably go and find that again. And what shocked them is that the more cannabis some of these ones were using, the better drivers they became. I I wish that that uh, we could arrange to go to a police training facility and sit there and do something like they did on Mythbusters with alcohol and the cops. You know, a shot, go for a drive, a shot, go for a drive. Instead, do a joint, go for a drive, joint, you know, just in a controlled that, environment. I that would, would be an awesome thing to do, but they would never let that happen. But we could do that on our own, though. Yeah, if we can get a big enough controlled environment for it. I think we should maybe uh, consider doing something like that. If anybody yeah, didn't they has... have the guys on Mythbusters riding tricycles and stuff? Yep. Why not do that? <laughs> we could do that. <laughs> That's just funny. No. I I did, um, you know those driving simulation things? Yes. Where they test your reflexes? Yes. I did one of those one time, and I did it perfectly straight, and I had really good response time. You had to step on the brake as soon as the stop sign come out so I I did this a few times and I was pretty consistent fairly quick um, I went out and I smoked a big old hash joint waited about 15 20 minutes I went in and I was twice as fast for response time every time and I figured I'll just stick with this hmm. so I mean there's ways that it can be tested, and people can prove it for themselves. No, but it's I just mean, a matter of it, it, doing it. It, 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 it what? It bother <laughs> it bothers me that that there aren't they're accusing uh, medical cannabis patients of this very bad thing, impaired driving. Right. But they've not done any fucking tests on it. Nope. So because I think that we they need just to assume. Well, okay. Well, this summer we're going to find a way to conduct our own little test with or without the authorities there. How's that? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I think we got to. Maybe I'll ask the police here and see if they would like to get involved. Yeah, and then I'll just I'll drive the thirty six hours there that it takes to get out there and just to sure. do a driver's well, test high. they'll arrest you for after the event for giving them pot, for trafficking in pot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no, or, I'll just bring in people that are licensed to use it. <clears throat> oh, yeah. And then, then there's no argument. Yeah. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Something to think about. Definitely something to think about. I mean, there, there's so many ways to prove the point that... <laughs> The problem is they don't want those points proven. They don't really have a choice at this point, though. <laughs> Not anymore. I mean, it's it's getting pretty mainstream. Um, and it's been mainstream for a number of years. Our biggest problem we have right now, and as the show was last week, we still have too many people hiding in the closet afraid to say the word cannabis or marijuana out loud because yeah. of that stereotyping that's been done. Mm. Mm -hmm. I hear you. That's 22. Yep. You just need a government with balls that'll stand up to corporations. So, yeah, well. Nadine, tell me something. What What's next for you? What, what is your plans next? What Where are you going? What direction are you going well, in? Are you <laughs> with respect to this medical marijuana matter, I'm going to uh, pursue uh, media wise other than you guys there's not much I can do because Calgary won't touch it in the newspapers media won't don't even want to listen legally I'm going to go see with uh, these lawyers at Dunn and Associates tomorrow and hopefully you know get some direction on uh, what they feel I should do 
and then ultimately I just have to self-represent and hope for the best. And I uh, I'm gonna go on John Turmel's gold star. I have one of his. I filed a gold star application, but they're all under the state under the Allard action. Um, I may just prepare some uh, my own federal something to put in court there. Right. I mean, I do this for a living. I write these things up, but I never take them to the next step. You know, you hand them over to the lawyer, and they take them down to the courthouse. Well, this time I'll take my own damn documents down there myself and file them. Write my own thing up. I can write my own motion up, my own affidavit of evidence. I'll do everything up and put this all proper. You know, like I did for Conroy and those guys. And then I'll do uh, or Chaton in the uh, Section 18 Federal Court Act request into the. Uh, MMPR LP application process. We I wrote all that up. I can do that. That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to write up as many documents as I can. I'm going to uh, not neither plead not guilty or anything. I'm just going to t tell him to stay it until you know his honor makes a decision in the Allardish action because I'm one of the left out. You know, there's a lot more people that didn't get their paperwork pushed through Health Canada than me. Then uh, you know my problem was I couldn't get a doctor to sign, but there's thousands of people that have been left out because Health Canada didn't process their paperwork or it's in the mail. Mm. They just got left out for one reason or another, and you cannot you know I mean they can do it you know, but uh, we can't we're not I'm not going to let them. I'm going to try my very best. I'm going to try and fundraise to help me uh, file this legal action. But I know I have a I can do most of the work myself. And I know I have a huge legal action against CDI College, and I'm going to take these funds. And you know, I have no life. I've got what five years left, maybe, on these pills. So I'm going to take my every the rest of my life and uh, get as much money as I can through these legal actions, uh, civil actions. Use what I need, and I want to put at least 30% into you know instead of get, paying a lawyer, I can 30% contingency fee to write these things up and take them to court. Well, I can do that myself. I don't need you. It's not rocket science. Thankfully, it's only law. It's interpretation and application of the law. I can look up the laws. I can write for myself. I can speak for myself. Although the judges here in Alberta don't want to hear it. They don't like self-rep. Can they refuse and you from self-representing? No. Oh, yeah. Okay. I got kicked out of court here on February 24, 2013. They wouldn't even listen to my uh, applic my response. She, she just right out, just kick it out. And so then she forces you to take a court of appeal or file a, a judicial review into her conduct. And, you know, most people aren't going to do that. You don't have the time. It's not worth it. It was just a little client that had, you know, it was a little... Uh, thirty thousand dollar debt thing or something. It was over the twenty five mark, so it was in Queen's Bench. But uh, she didn't want to listen to anything I had to say on behalf of my my client, you know, myself, which was myself. I was self wrapping. I had a store in Calgary. My daughter and I had a store. Tell you more redneck mentality. My daughter, Sarcy Indian. She sees her cousins all dying, doing drugs, fentanyl. She said, "Mommy, what can I do for these people?" Well, let's open a store. We opened a store in Calgary called Sweet Grass Curio Shop. Gifts for the mind, body, and soul. We sold. We had a smudging station there, and we had it was right kind of downtown Calgary. You can go back there, burn some sweet grass, smudge, sage, incense, whatever you want. And uh, we so I am a medium myself, so we sold tarot cards, crystals, Ouija boards, things like that. Also in the back of the store, I had um, a cannabis uh, phytotherapy lifestyle products, where I sold pipes, bongs, grinders. The owner of the building. Um, had no problem with the pipes and bongs. He didn't like when I started doing uh, holding, uh, teaching people how to douse with crystals, remote viewing stuff like that. He calls and when I held, uh, I did readings for people. He called this wizardry, and where he's from is a form of wizardry and punishable, punishable by death in Syria. Like that's where he's from. So he sent down the uh, prairie bailiffs, the sheriff's bailiffs and seized all our, put locks on the door, we couldn't get in the store, that was my daughter was seven months pregnant, and uh, she wanted to, she, they had taken all the stuff, everything, she said, I want to go get my sweet grass to smudge my baby, you know what the sheriff's bailiff said, this is white man's land, go back to your reserve, B-I-T-C-H, well, that threw her into premature labor, me into a transglobal amnesia attack, oh my god, but this is Redneck, Alberta. It's different. And the people have a lot, you know, we're bringing people, I have a lot of ethnics as clients. They mostly are my clients. 
And they bring over, you know, we got our multiculturalism. Sure, bring over your customs and beliefs. And some of them are pretty damn strange. I can tell you some of the stuff. <laughs> I could have eight shows on the stuff that I know about their people. Like my client from India who use um, casting uh, curses on their competition. She's a real estate developer here in Calgary. And... Um, what they do is, I was doing her books. I said, "Hey, what's all these checks? You know, seven thousand, five thousand for this one legal, you know, Punjabi something legal consultant." And I says, "Well, if you're going to write it off, it has to be relevant to the business." Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, "Well, what legal problems did you have?" Well, it wasn't really legal problems. What this guy is is some kind of psychic, and he puts curses on each other. Like she put a curse on her competitor, he put a curse on her, but it's not written off as curses. It's legal consulting fees, right? Yeah. I mean, they bring over a lot of really weird practice, and these people believe this to the nth degree that if the more power, and it's kind of, I thought of my mother-in-law's medicine bag, right? You know, the more money I got, the more this medicine bag's been handed around, the more power it has, the more money I can throw at your uh, investment project, your real estate investment project, or whatever they're doing, you know, the more power I have, and they truly believe this like the sun comes up every single day, and that's just one of their little beliefs. Well, I mean, everybody needs something to believe in. If you want to believe in curses, then spend that kind of money for well, them. Don't write them uh, off for income tax. Well, all the power to you. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's it's everybody has their own beliefs. Um, That's fine, but you don't write them off for income you tax. Can. You don't misrepresent what you're doing and put it through I, the books to the tenant. I'm, I'm sure people out there think that I believe cannabis is a medicine. Yeah, and they would actually be wrong. I well, I no, I you're right. I do believe it because it's a fact. I know it. Um, but there's still the naysayers who aren't going to believe us at all. So you're you found a lawyer, you figure? Well, no, he. I think he's a tire kicker. He just wants. Do you know why? I think he's somebody's little snitch, somebody's little bitch, and they want to find out what Nadine's up to. So I had. I didn't consult this guy. I got a call out of the blue yesterday, just actually after I talked to you, right after I talked to you. And then I, uh, I would go for it and see if, oh. because he may be somebody who realizes that, because it could be an ambulance chaser, and yeah. realizes that there's a, a cash payout for him in the end, which is all the power to him, because. Really, that's what you want to do is go after that cash settlement for. for oh, I can do this anyway, so. myself. I I can, I don't need him for that. I do that for every day, for work. Yeah, but going in with a lawyer. Oh yeah, I know. That's, I know the, I, that's what I just can't stomach the thought of giving him thirty percent for standing there. For, you know, like this now, guy, six and a half grand to me to plead guilty. I said, you know, that's an effectual rate of about $2,800 an hour you're getting. You're only going to be with me about three hours in total. You know, that's in, unreal to plead yeah. guilty. No. And across the country, everybody's doing things just a little bit differently. In the Atlantic Canada, we've got uh, Maritimers United for Medical Marijuana. That I are doing know, that's things. great. The court support initiative, and we're now gathering lawyers' names who have an understanding of medical marijuana, as well as filing charter challenges for defenses. Yeah. Um, and well, then I'm going to look to Mum for now. plenty of support. <laughs> well, we don't have any lawyers uh, on our list for Alberta, but uh, we definitely have some here. We've got some really intelligent people, though, in that organization. There's there's actually intelligent people in all the organizations. It's just a matter of, of being able to listen to them. Too bad they couldn't work together, eh? Well, well he I mean, said that, that, voice. that was the idea behind the Medicinal Cannabis Patients Alliance of Canada, was basically act as a voice, uh, an impartial voice with no hidden agendas mm -hmm. uh, to basically try and unite all of the medicinal users. The the problem is it's egos and pride get in the way of too many. Well, I think the problem people. is they don't have the skills and the experience to do. They are, you know, how many people have a political background or that type of background to do it? You know, they're plumbers or they were construction workers and they got sick and then they got political. But they don't right. have a lifetime of experience behind them. You know, like this is why I understand this. I worked on the Constitution with Pierre Trudeau, Jean Chrétien, Serge Wayne, Senator Harry Hayes. I know what is I need it. I feel we like actually, 
we but actually have... do have some political. But why aren't they doing Politi anything? What are they doing? Um, who are they? Who are they? Because no, I mean in for for in the maritimes or, or the maritimes here. Um, federally, you're not going to get anybody that's going to go against what their party says. No. Plain and simple, because it's their job. And I'll give you a perfect example. Um, I live in a riding that has been run by conservatives for a very long time. And one of the politicians that was elected as a conservative in Harper's government got thrown out of the Conservative Party for go voting against Harper. Oh, yeah. Um, basically, he did it because he didn't want to see us get screwed. Wow. So he voted against Harper. Yeah, I heard about and that. Harper threw him out of the caucus, mm -hmm. and that's totally fine. Well, now he's running this year as a liberal, and his campaign is pretty simple for him. They threw me out of the conservatives for sticking up for my people or my constituents, and he'll be eschewing the win, and we'll finally get rid of our our conservative. And what's his name? What's the name of the elected official? That one was Bill Casey. Bill Casey. Bill Casey. I'm yeah. gonna Google him. Voted against Harper. Got thrown out because he didn't want to see his constituents get screwed like everybody else. Right on. So, this is how politics works. I mean, you vote for the person that you want to win because you hope they'll have your best interests. But if they're in a party that could, couldn't give a shit about you or your interests because they're only concerned about corporate interests, then it doesn't matter who you vote it. So, even though this guy is now going to run as a liberal, um, it's not him calling the shots. So we may still get screwed, but at least it'll be screwed under a different color for a change. Well, it's just, I mean, every party screwed us every year or so, or, or every term. I just wish somebody would ask me first before they fuck me. Yeah, or at least give you a kiss when they're done. Well, you know, or or dinner. I know that's yeah. an old. Or maybe old... maybe they don't kiss you when they're done because they're not done screwing you over. Yeah, that's right. You know, uh, uh, there's uh, just to change the subject real quick. There's there's a lot of bullshit going on, uh, you know, stemming from uh, this this whole police thing down in the states this week. And I'm sitting here, and I during the show I always have CNN on. I like CNN. You can t say whatever the fuck you want. About that, I don't give a shit. But anyways, they were they were <laughs> they were talking about this other thing that's happened now, where the police have video from a police helicopter of many officers beating the living shit out of a guy after he jumped down off of his horse. I don't know any of the particulars, but they're they're you know they're talking about it and stuff like that, right? It's it 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 it's uh. well. Here's their here's I I have have no idea why our police forces both in Canada and the U.S. are escalating the violence to the rate that they're doing. Do they do do they like one of the reasons I would really like to have somebody regular on the show from Australia or from Europe is because I'd like to be able to say, hey. Sven, do they have this kind of problem in Sweden? You yeah, know, exactly. Like I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm joking, but I'm seriously, I'd like to ask those questions. So if you're from places overseas and you've got something you want to say, please join us in the conversation. Anyway, yeah. that's my little plug to try and plug people. Yeah, I like plugging. <laughs> All right. So there's an update in the chat room. Hillary says that they stole the horse. They sold the, the horse. Guy, the guy stole the horse, and he was on the ground, and they tased him, and then beat the living crap out of him. Okay. So, I mean, it's pretty easy to beat somebody up after you tase them. 
No, but I mean, they had. He was down on the ground. I just saw the foot the footage. He was on the ground, and they laid into him. And then other cops came along, and it's all recorded on a chopper video. So I mean, now there's going to be. My whole point is, I don't know the you know the particulars, obviously, but this it, it, is from what I'm seeing from the escalation of violence again. from the police on both sides. It's almost like they're trying to incite a revolution. It's it, but yeah. but. It's almost like they want the people to fight back. It's getting to it. it it's really seeming to be like that, isn't it? It I, is. I mean, it's it's it, gone it's, from the. It's point almost of, like they're literally trying to instigate a revolution so that they can be overthrown. Yeah, it's like they're creating the problem to implement the solution they already have. Right? They know they. It's you know what I mean. They're creating yeah. the problem. Well. You create a revolution, then you can call a military state or, or uh, okay. call it military law, and and it justifies the anti-terror bill, and and you know your your people are the terrorists. Mm -hmm. So, all we need to do is get more people to start using cannabis, and they'll realize that you're you're being set up. Well, I think they don't want you using cannabis is because it makes you passive rather than aggressive. Like my dad fought in the war, eh? and he said they used to get rum rations. He fought Hitler all, like, all over Africa, and, that, and they get rum rations. They get them three, four, you know, be, just make them go, 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 because alcohol make you go like that. Yeah. And he was in the Middle East, and they did, his sergeants and that didn't like them going into the... Uh, Smoking the hash dens in Palestine and all that because it made them too complacent. They were ready to it's not so them. much. It's not so much That's complacent. Good. You know what it is? They ask why. Yeah, why well, you query? Yeah, why am I doing? Why? Why? Hey, why? Why am I gonna go blow up somebody's head off? I'm sitting here sipping tea and smoking. Why? Sh why should I shoot innocent people? Yeah. 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 No. Right? Yeah. That, and that's that's what it is. Is um, what were the studies that the U.S. did? Uh, trying to think. Um, ultra, ultra, ultra. What? I'm gonna remember. Ultra MK. No. Yes, Ultra MK. I know all about that. All right. So this the studies that they did with the different drugs mm -hmm. on people mm -hmm. and deem them dangerous and illegal because they were trying to use cannabis and LSD and, and things like that for mind control. Well, I'm sorry, if you're going to give somebody cannabis and think you can control their mind, you got another thing coming. Well, that's pharmaceutical job. Yeah, well, they've tested on enough of those, too. And word magic. You know, mind control is, reefer madness, is, is linguistics. Yeah. Using the proper words to... You know what? When I was in England, I was working over in the UK, and... Uh, I was working for these people, and it was slow. It was an accounting firm, and there's a law firm right across the road from us because we always work together. And one of the lawyers came, brought me in. He says, well, because he knew, he knew I was a writer. I wrote children's stories and things. He, he was the East Indian fellow. He says, uh, he asked me to write this uh, uh, statement of claim up for No, the know, affidavit of evidence, some document anyway. And I says, no, no, I said, yeah, I'm not smart. I said, I can't write that stuff. And he says, listen to me. He says, we, we both got the same client, right? I says, yeah. He says, but we got to convince him he's worth 10,000 pounds. He said, you, he says, you have to uh, analyze the transactions, prepare a financial statement, and come up with the figures and, and interpret these figures and explain you're worth 10,000 pounds. He says, me, all I got to do is wrap my words around his brain and convince him he's worth $10,000. Now who's got the hardest job? And that's when I thought, bloody hell, now I'm getting out of accounting and forensic auditing. I'm going into law. And that's when I did start taking an interest in law and start writing. That's how I started writing up. Becoming a historiographer and a legal chronologist was writing up documents because as a forensic auditor, what we do is we look for white-collar corporate crime. And when you find these uh, wrongdoings, you have to write up a report so you get really good at writing all the details, which is called the historiography of the white crime, like, you know, Bernie Madoff, what did you do? Well, you started out here, did this and did that. And then you take that and you whole document and you put, you split it up between your affidavit of evidence, some of its evidence and some of its statement of claim. And that's what I learned over there. And, uh, yeah, 
I can't remember why I was telling you that was significant. <laughs> <laughs> well, that oh, excuse me. It is not rocket science. Law is not, thankfully, it's not quantum <laughs> physics. It's not rocket science, and we can all do it. And I mean, what I would like to do is work with these lawyers. I'm going to propose to this guy, you know, I'm the first one to know how much is that duck call? What do you want? You know, stand up and speak for me. And I will, you know what? I am so old and I have I have no dignity. I have no pride left. When you smoke bomb strip search in front of a bunch of greasy construction workers over here and other students over there, oh, what was left? You know, <laughs> I will go to the end. You know what? You're going to throw me in jail? No, I will stand there and speak for you. You know what, Your Honor? If you all listen to me, throw me out of your court, throw me in jail. You know what? I'll be back tomorrow. Well, then I can write these things till hell freezes over. If I can write them up for the oil company, for Revenue Canada, and for Price Waterhouse, I can write them up for myself. It's not rocket science, thankfully. Just then now. I hope we get lots of updates of what's going on in your, your well, endeavors I, in yeah. the future. Well, yeah, I'll keep you posted. I, I don't do uh, I don't usually do media, and uh, I'm just gonna I just I'm just gonna plug away and do my work. So if, if you want to do this little thing here, what you did, how you got a hold of me, whatever that magic, you know that computer. We'll know. find you. Yeah, whatever you did with that Google Plus. If you want to contact me that way or email me, I'll I'll keep your prize because I'm not letting it go. I no, have, uh, I don't think you should let it go. I honestly think you have more than enough grounds for a charter challenge. And more bloody than hell, enough. if I can get the MMAR up and going, I can do this. My yeah. God, working with those people was far harder than doing anything like this. Believe me. And we are out of time again, Al. Yeah, <laughs> we are. Listen, I, I want to uh, just say hello to Roy. Thank you for listening. We've got a new listener uh, oh, who hi, sent, Roy. sent us a little hi, email. Roy saying that he's enjoying the show um, next week I don't know who we have joining us yet but we're on, working on that one yeah, on the uh, first I think it first is, of right? May will be Lawrence Cherniak and his uh, he's going to talk to us about hashish from all over the world Wow! we had him on uh, in the chat room last week he was wandering around the jungles of Peru and we hope he's going to be back and available for the first hope so and uh, if you if you got something to say and you want to say it get a hold of us and uh, maybe we'll have you on the show yeah, yeah. We, we're always looking for people if you got uh, somebody you want to talk about cannabis related hit us up we'll we'll, uh, we'll let you have your say right Nadine Yes, thank you very much. It's been a privilege and an honor. I greatly enjoyed talking with you gentlemen tonight. I oh, appreciate you being on with us, Nadine. And, yeah, and really the, anybody. the best of luck to everybody. We don't care if we offend anybody. My apologies <laughs> to Mayor Nenshi. Okay, Mayor Nenshi, if you're listening. <laughs> but, yeah, best of luck with everything that you've got ongoing. Thank you very much. All right. And what, what, all right, what? All right, I guess... Nadine left us. She left us. Yeah. So we'll say good night. We're going to listen we'll to. I found a video that I thought was funny, but I was enjoying the conversation, so I didn't play it. I'm going to play it now, though. Uh, Go for it. <laughs> it, it. It's it's a six year old kid uh, teaching some rappers how to really rap, and it's called uh, now he's got street cred, and it went viral. So I thought I'd play that. And then we got some uh, Chief Green, but I just want to get high. And then we'll say goodnight. And this is the 420 Radio Show. We are here live Fridays, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. What time in your time zone over there? 8 p.m. in my time zone. Oh, I don't know if I it, like that. It was 5 p.m. in the Deans. So we had a good range across the country. Yes, we did. So, and on that we'll note, talk to you next week. We'll talk to you next week. So I had a, like a hip hop song, then dirty sex, and the first thing you're gonna need is a beat. Now we need piano. Now we're gonna need strings. Now you need bass. Now you need 
need to laugh about your problems. I wanted a cookie, but Mom wanted to know. So I took it anyway, so that's how it goes. Now deal with it. Just deal with it. Got grounded for a week, candy cake. Now I got street cred, more than Drake. Now deal with it. Just deal with it. Problem, I don't know what to do. Every time I smoke weed, my girl comes unglued. She gets her granny panties all up in a wad. If I fire up a bowl of some really good pot, now I don't want to offend her little delicate nose. But I need a buzz, and that's just how it goes. So when she's got a fucking problem that I want to get stoned. Start contemplating about living alone Cause I just want to get high That's what I really want I just want to get high I like to smoke a lot I can't believe she doesn't realize I've got a question and I need to know It may sound kind of funny but here I go How did I end up with a girl that doesn't like to get baked it's like putting dill pickles on your birthday cake I guess it's time for me to make a choice Do I quit smoking weed or just put up with her noise Yes, a little bit of bitchin' beats being alone And I can handle anything as long as I'm stoned Cause I just want to get high That's what I really want I just want to get high I like to smoke a lot of can't believe She doesn't realize just can't believe it I just want to get high I just want to get high I just want to get high I think I need to get high I just want to get high I really want to get high I just Fucking need to get high. I just want to get high. I just wanna get high. You like music, you like weed, well we. How much I like more than smoking trees They'll make you dance the dope z do And teach you how to achieve the growth Smoke a bowl on the 420 Radio Show On Lifestyle Radio What are you doing? Nothing. Nothing? Why not? I'm trying to get on this Lifestyle Radio website Sounds like a cool website Yeah, it's alright oh. You might have it. You're listening to Lifestyle Radio.